Okay, I think uh, people will keep coming, but I think we can start uh, our meetup today. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I see many people who uh, who were attending our previous meetups. It's really great to see people coming back. And if someone is new, uh, welcome to the bug out community. I'm, uh, I'm sharing a link uh, to join our bug out Slack where we will uh, publish a uh, video recording of this talk and if uh, uh, Krish uh, will be open to post uh, also slides of his talk and in general if you want to connect uh, with uh, with our speaker he's in our slack so you can also ask your questions directly there uh, so today I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker Ganapathy Krishnan uh, also like Krish uh, who is a, a VP of engineering at Flipkart, which is the largest e-commerce platform in India. And his team did like really great job at uh, developing conversational AI technology. And uh, basically what they built is um, like a digital assistant that can uh, respond to uh, users' questions about uh, different products. And basically today, uh, uh, Krish will share how they built, what challenges did they encounter <laughs> while they were building this, and um, and he's also happy to take any questions you might have. Um, thanks, thanks, Krish, uh, for for finding time to uh, uh, to share your your project with our community. Thank you, Sophia, and and I'm delighted to be here uh, to share this. I'm really passionate about this area, so I wanted to get started real quickly by giving you a background about India and Flipkart. So India can be really looked at as many Indias. Um, now, because the market poses some very peculiar challenges. India is not a homogenous country. Uh, it's a very diverse country and uh, it has different diversity in its geography, culture, literacy levels, um, income levels and so on, right? And uh, so one size solutions, for example, don't actually work well in a country like India. Um, one interesting example is, you know, most people might find interesting is that credit card customers are only top of funnel in India. So um, most people don't have credit cards and don't interact with credit cards. So one of the things that Flipkart did uh, early on when it got started was cash on delivery. So which is kind of an unheard of concept here. Like imagine, your Amazon guy shows up and you pay them cash and take your goods, right? But that is what Flipkart does in India with a lot of, a lot of its customers. The e-commerce market is growing rapidly. It's expected to hit $200 billion by 2026. Uh, and for those of you who are not super familiar with India, India is um, really in terms of GDP, it's, uh, it's really accelerated and it's ahead of things like the United Kingdom. Uh, and so on, right? So India has really accelerated. I think it's uh, fourth or fifth or on the top of the list. I think the fifth after, I think it's after uh, Germany and Japan, but um, but pretty much it's uh, up there in terms of uh, GDP and growth and so on, right? So what is Flipkart doing? Flipkart has 350 million registered customers and India has a population of close to 1.3 billion. We support 11 languages. Uh, we, we've invested in a tech-enabled supply chain to support hundreds and thousands of sellers. And again, as I mentioned, we have a cash on delivery uh, offering. Um, so we are also investing heavily in uh, the voice and uh, uh, regional languages space because a lot of people want to communicate with us through a regional language. So to give you a sense, uh, voice is a big deal in India. And um, we've launched a voice search in India and in 11 languages, and people are using it regularly, uh, far more than people use it in the, in the US, for example. So the uh, monthly active users has been growing rapidly for voice. Uh, for voice. Uh, when I say Vernac, I mean regional languages has also been growing very rapidly. Our customers want to interact in regional languages and not just in English, though a lot of people in India are English literate. Okay, so what is the current e-commerce paradigm? The current e-commerce paradigm uh, is based on uh, the following, right? First, you do a search, 
then you have a product description, specifications, user generated content, and then you base your decisions uh, by looking at external product descriptions and so on. Most of us go through this, this kind of uh, methodology to find and buy products. And Flipkart has a similar experience as well. Uh, but the experience is that in India, people mix English and local languages and time it, type it in English. So for example, if you want to search for a girl's shoes, girl's slippers, people may type Ladki Chapal. Ladki stands for girl in, in Hindi. And people mix these different languages when they search and Flipkart actually has to uh, support these users, right? Um, and uh, the thing is, the if you want to take this current experience to the next 500 million people, it's going to be slow because people are not used to this kind of approach. So for example, when you ask these people, tell them ask to add to cart, they have no idea what you're talking about, right? The whole the whole thing that we've developed about adding to cart and things like that are, are new concepts for a lot of people. So how do we simplify the shopping journey, right? So if you look at the shopping journey, these are the different stages of the shopping journey. You have search and discovery, uh, decision and transacting, and then customer service, right? And uh, if you look at that, right, the search and discovery is where you can do a search, or you want to discover a product that uh, through browsing, you may want to discover a product that you really want to um, purchase, right? The decision part is where you are not make, you now have to make a decision. Is this the right thing for me? Does it meet my needs, right? And uh, the transact is of course, adding the cart to the product, uh, adding the product to the cart. And then uh, customer service, you know, is about product delivery, exchange returns and stuff like that. Right. So in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the decision part of it, because that is a bot that my team in the US has built. Um, so if you look at the various components for this assistant, right, uh, and some of it is work in progress. So I've put that in yellow. <clears throat> so when somebody speaks, we have to first convert that from uh, speech to text, then we have to translate it because it could be in any language. Um, and then the next step is to do intent recognition and named entity recognition. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what each of these things are uh, later on in the talk. So one of the key classifiers that you've built is to determine, can we answer this question for the user or not, right? And this is actually a really hard problem, but we've built a classifier to do that. And if we have, if you're, if you're fairly confident that we can't answer this question, then what we do is we send it to a agent to help the user. Okay. And if we can answer this question, we will generate the answer, and we'll generate this answer through FAQs, reviews, product descriptions, and specifications. So we do this through a whole bunch of things like this. And finally, we'll translate it back and convert it to a voice and give it back to the user. So that is the entire flow of how uh, this whole decision assistant uh, works. Okay. Now I want to pause here for a few minutes to see if anyone has any questions uh, before I go to the next part. I don't see questions in our chat, but guys, feel free to ask them or post or unmute yourself and ask if you if there's something um, is is unclear. Could you talk a little more about the answerable one because that's going to be a, um, a opportunity to go down the funnel or uh, pass it on directly to a live agent. So is answerable like a giant uh, search index uh, that you quickly are able to glean? Uh, is that how you make the decision? Um, the way that we decide whether something is answerable or not, I think I just, the question is, how do we determine whether something is answerable or not? So the way that we determine whether something is answerable or not is by a couple of ways. Right? One is that first is we have an intent classifier. And the intent classifier gives us a confidence score to see, is this something that we are confident about the intent? Right. So let's say we are not confident about the intent, then obviously 
uh, such queries will go into the non-answerable bucket, right? Second thing is that even if we have the intent, uh, do we, are we able to find an answer in our database, right? And if you're able to find the answer in the database, obviously it's answerable. But if you're able to find, when I say database, I mean it very generally. I don't mean a SQL database. I'm saying that, do we mean, can we get answers from, uh, uh, from product specifications, from product descriptions, from uh, things like uh, uh, reviews, FAQs, and other sources? So we have a bunch of sources. Can we get an answer from them? And there's a probability score that's calculated based on how good we think the answer is. And these are all used to compute whether we think we can answer the question or not. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Yes, that, that sounds good. Um, now, is, this, is everything built from scratch or do you leverage some of the cloud offering uh, uh, base NLP stuff? Like is um, each one of these components that you have in yellow and gray uh, built from scratch? They're all built from scratch, except except that we use models, we use various models and I'll talk about it a little bit. We use some of the technologies, like uh, we use uh, word embeddings, sentence embeddings, BERT. Uh, yes, of course, yes, yes. All that, but, but pretty much all these components are built from scratch. We have our own translation, we have our own speech to text. Uh, all of this is built from scratch. And there's a reason for that is we tried a lot of you know, out of the box solutions from Microsoft, Google, and so on, and they just didn't work well for our context. Uh, and I'll give you a lot of interesting examples why they didn't work, right? Uh, as an example- You've already mentioned the multilingual, which being an Indian myself, I can, can fully appreciate. But but it's not even, even more than being multilingual. It's because of the e-commerce context. There are multilingual translations and so on that Google provides. But I'll give you a very simple query. For example, suppose in the e-commerce context, someone asks this question, and I'm going to say this in Hindi, right? So some of you may understand it or not. It, is product ka kya quality hai, right? So what this, what this means is, what is the quality of this product? Now, if you notice, I've mixed Hindi with English, right? And what some of these translation things tend to do is they don't, they don't really get it that product for most people in India is product. You don't need to translate product into a Hindi word called Utpad. Nobody understands what Utpad means because colloquial Hindi, people don't use such words, right? And against quality, quality is a very commonly used word that's mixed with every language in India, right? And what some of these translators do is they take quality, especially if it's misspelled like quality. And uh, we had an example where it got translated into a a mattress, right, in Hindi, right, or chadar, or quilt. And so these are the kind of things that they do where they don't know which words to translate and which words not to translate. So they just translate everything. And that creates, plays havoc with a lot of the models. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks. I think Eric, Eric also asked the same question, but I think Eric uh, Krish already responded like that. Uh, basically, his question was mm -hmm. if, if you guys build from scratch or you use some uh, existing solutions. And so basically, yeah. you, mostly you had to build from scratch. We really don't want to build from scratch, but honestly, it's a lot of work. But uh, just the, the generic systems out there, just, they just don't work well. And we evaluated a, a, a number of them and we published scores around them. Mm. Um, How long did it did it uh, take you to, for your team to to build uh, this from scratch? Just to understand, like the how long it takes normally. Yeah. So the speech to text uh, is a company we acquired called Live.ai. So we acquired the company, and they were really top of their game in India. So we acquired them. The translation thing, you know, it's taken about a year or so for the translation work, which my team didn't do. Uh, I'm leveraging the work of our team in India. Uh, the decision bot work that we did, it took us about a year, approximately a year and three months to actually mm -hmm. get it to production and launch it in production. Okay. So, you know, it is, it, uh, it is uh, to get the first POC is the easy part, but to actually do everything, put everything together and get it to production takes a long, takes longer, right? Now it's like fully in production. Yes, it's fully in production uh, for a few verticals. So where we are is um, we have 1,500 verticals in uh, Flipkart and we are in production 
we started with production for two of the most common verticals, mobile and fashion. And now a big part of what we're doing this year is how do we take it to the next 15, the next set of verticals, and we're working on a rapid way to take it there. And those are some of the big scale up challenges that we have, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, should I continue or do you have yeah, any more questions? Yeah, thank you. So, um, so in terms of intents, right, when you get a query, so you have like a decision intent. This is the decision intent that we're working on, but we can get a whole bunch of other intents as well. And so the top level intents are called Uber intents, right? But once we determine that it's a decision intent, then we have other classifiers that run that determine whether they are common intents or product spec intents. And let explain to you what the difference is. For example, suppose you have a 1500 verticals. There are a whole bunch of intents that are common across all verticals. Like for example, like things like payment options, offers, things like that. Right? These are common across all intents and there's no need for us to build separate intent models for all these, right? But for certain areas, you need to build more detailed intent models. And these are more product specific questions, right? So the, the challenge for us is we don't want to build 1500 intent models based on 1500 verticals. We want to build maybe a handful of them, maybe 30 or 40, right, to support all of them. And so what we're doing is we're trying to figure out where we can uh, use things across all verticals versus where we actually need to group uh, verticals together into one category that we can group things like, you know, fashion, uh, other things into say a category called lifestyle, and then we can build intent around that, right? Uh, that can do pretty well in that area. If you use the same intent model for every vertical, then you, you're going to have the situation, the quality is not going to be that good, right? So it's a balance of how many models versus quality, right? So that's what we do in terms of the intent hierarchy. And then um, what we do is we use NER, right? So this NER is very useful because what it does is, let's say the question is, is the shirt available in blue? Then entity's color and value is blue. Right? And we're trying to find that entity. And this helps us in a couple of ways. The first is it helps us populate an API. So if you're going to find out, is this shirt available in blue? Right? I need to populate an API and ask a question, Can I? is this available and is it in stock? Right? Not only is it available, but it's also in stock. So this allows me to populate that API, get the answer back and tell the user uh, that yes, the shirt is available in blue uh, and you can order it right now. Or uh, yes, the shirt is available in blue, but it is on back order. So we can give them information like that using this kind of um, uh, information, right? The second area where NER is used is also used to mask queries. And what this means is, let's say we have a whole bunch of queries, like is this shirt available in blue? But you know, we may not have queries like, is the shirt available in blue? Is the shirt available in teal? Is the shirt available in green? And we may not have, thousands of queries in different ways, right? Stated in different ways. So what we can do is we can take this query, is the shirt available in blue, and then mask it and, and train on the query, is the shirt available in, in angular bracket color, close angular bracket, which means we are training on something that's more generic than is the shirt available in blue. So what this allows us to do, allows us to gen help ML models generalize better. Okay, um, question before I move on, questions? Okay, uh, so use cases and technologies, right? So we use, um, we use word embeddings. We use fast text uses inputs to represent words as vectors, right? And we've trained this on our own e-commerce corpus so that they can perform really well. And we get very high performance for that. And we also use sentence embeddings uh, a bird-based Siamese network. And these are inputs and represent the queries as vectors, right? And we are very mindful of where we use each because the word emittings are much faster with uh, sequence models and so on. And so for intent recognition, for low latency applications such as intent recognition, we use sequence models that use word embeddings as input inputs, right? And we also use this for any uh, named entity recognition. Uh, and uh, because these models have to literally respond in 
uh, milliseconds, right? In a few milliseconds. Uh, now we use transformer-based models for complex tasks like span-based answer extraction. So the idea is that you ask a question, I need to find your answer in a piece of text, right? And that's a much more sophisticated task. And so for that, we use, uh, uh, we use things like Albert in order to do that, right? And there are other more complex tasks, like for example, generative transformer models. The whole idea is that how do we uh, generate an answer automatically from different data sources? So we, we also work on that to take information from different data sources like reviews and FAQs and decide you know, which answers to show first, right? That is relevant to the question. So this is far more sophisticated task. Uh, some of these tasks, uh, require GPUs for inference. For example, both the generative transformer task and the other, other task, the spam-based ancestor extraction, they both require GPUs, whereas the intent models can be run on CPUs extremely fast. Mm -hmm. um, so here's some learnings that might be useful. One is whenever possible, use lightweight models, right? So we always start using the lightweight models and, and making sure that we can use them like uh, most of the sequence to sequence models are very lightweight. So we can use lightweight models. Um, second is that we need a really good ML ops infrastructure because the, what you want with your data science team is you want them to be experimenting on more ideas and you don't want them to be worried about how this whole model is trained and deployed and uh, all the production aspects of it, right? So to have a great ML ops infrastructure means that you can improve your data science productivity by a factor of two. I mean, it's really that uh, two or three, right? So, so people can do two or three times as many experiments. So this is a really valuable thing because you really want data science is unpredictable, right? Uh, so you have to do a lot of experiments. Um, third is that it's important to have the right tools for labeling and ensuring that the data quality is high, right? So um, one of the things we found initially was that uh, people who are doing supervised labeling, you know, often um, will, uh, will do things like, you know, I don't understand what they're trying to label. So you get things like you get high disagreement between them, right? So we use various metrics like disagreement rates, um, labeler quality metrics and so on, because, you know, obviously if your data is bad, your model is not going to do that well, right? So this is really important. Active learning helps reduce labeling costs. And essentially what active learning does is it helps you focus on labeling things that really need to be labeled rather than labeling everything. Um, and labeling bandwidth is expensive. So the more we can reduce things in this area, the better. We also do a lot of synthetic data generation and also masking in order to reduce labeling costs. Now, uh, finally, we need to have great analytics. So think about analytics right up front so that you can tune and fix your models because don't assume that your models are going to be good right in the beginning. So having analytics and doing this thing iteratively will get you to your, um, uh, get, you, get you what you want very quickly. Here are some new areas we are working on. We are working on incorporating high quality chit chat. And the goal is that when you're conversing with someone, having some chit chat is really useful because people ask questions like, you know, what is the weather in Bangalore? Or, um, you know, I've you, people even ask questions like, will you marry me, right? And you, it's a good idea to, to have a good comeback instead of saying, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Um, zero shot or few shot learning. This is another super important area for us because we are trying to minimize our labeling costs. Incorporating video reviews. We'd like to incorporate, how can I show videos? Uh, how can I show the video? Let's say you ask me a question, right? This is a, let's say you ask me a question, you know, what is the, uh, will this camera take good night shots? Imagine if I can then uh, look through all the data I have and then show you a video that says, hey, here's what the night shots look like, right? So to do that, right? Um, integration between decision, discovery, post-purchase, chit-chat, and so on. So at the end of the day, the customer doesn't know whether it's decision, discovery, post-purchase, or chit-chat. So having good integration between these things really help. And we find actually in the post-purchase, we find that 10% of the queries are decision queries. So what happens is people have bought the product, 
and suddenly they get bias remorse and they say, oh my God, does this phone have two SIMs, right? And they didn't, they, they already bought it, but now they have this uh, remorse and they want to ask a question. So we find that's what happens. Uh, abstract summarization. And this is another great area where you can take information from multiple sources, summarize it, and then present it back to the user. Generative models for answers. And these are things that allow us to actually develop, uh, generate more uh, intuitive, non-template based answers. Today, a lot of the answers we generate are based on rules and templates. So we want to go to a more generative ML based model and many more such things. Uh, so these are it's, it, uh, at a high level, this is what we're working on. Super exciting area. It's a, um, we've been at this for about a year and three months or so. And uh, this is a multi-year journey for us to create an amazing uh, conversational experience with our customers in all these areas, in all these languages. I, I see a question. Uh, what are some lightweight sequence models uh, did you use? Or um, by LSTMs, we use the by LSTM models. Uh, they are very, very lightweight and and they are very. Uh, we, we've got very good uh, performance from them. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I see Ma Mahazad uh, raised your hand. Yeah, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi. So my question is that when you have, uh, like, for example, the instant hierarchy, yeah. For each uh, section, you like you need to like use a different model. Definitely, one model is not going to work for every aspect of this. So, how do you like combine or integrate all these models so that you can get the uh, desired outcome um, based on uh, like all these uh, like models and data and everything? Yeah. So, um, really, really good question. So. Typically, we'll have multiple models and uh, very often many of these models are going to run in parallel. And then we will have one model that combines the input of these different models and then it'll, it'll give us some additional information. That's kind of even the way the answerability works, right? So we have inputs from different models and some of these models are running in parallel. And then we combine them and we train another model to identify what we're trying to look for, right? So that's the general approach that we're going to take is that we may train like 30, 40 models, but we'll have one model that will disambiguate and tell us, you know, which one to use. Okay, thank you. I'm wondering, you mentioned about uh, infrastructure. Uh, do you use uh, some solutions or you also sort of build infrastructure? Uh, um, so we we have gone a lot of our home homegrown infrastructure solutions, right? So we had to build a bunch of these things on our own. Um, but for for and for this for the whole variety of reasons why we did what we did, including the fact that um, because Flipkart is such a giant company, we have a lot of infosec and other things that we need to worry about um, from a hacker point of view and so on, right? So. Um, we have uh, many such things to take care of and it was easier to build some of our things. We are re-looking at some of these things to see whether we should do some external solutions as well. But there's a number of external solutions out there. And, uh, um, you know, you, you've got to, you can look at some of these cloud providers and they have some good solutions in this area uh, to do the entire ML infrastructure and so on. And we are looking at them as well. Mm -hmm. So I see a question in our chat. How do you ensure scalability in such architecture? How, can you repeat that again? How do you ensure scalability in such architecture? Uh, um, yeah, really, really good question, right? How do you ensure uh, scalability? So when you think about scalability, you can have scalability in multiple dimensions, right? So let's talk about what kind of scalability. First of all, uh, our product has to scale across multiple languages has to scale across multiple verticals uh, and also has to scale across uh, customer bandwidth and so on. Uh, so let's start with let's start with scaling across hundreds and thousands of millions of customers. That's actually a relatively easy problem for us because essentially um, you know our cloud 
uh, automatically provisions machines that we want in order to scale uh, horizontally, right? So that part is an easier solution for us. Uh, we can auto scale up and down, add more CPUs, throw more CPUs at it. And those kinds of things are done automatically for us. So it's not hard for us. And we have got a lot of experience doing it because we have peaks on billion day and then it goes down and so on, right? The, the, the harder part for scaling is things like how do we scale across 1500 verticals, right? And the way that we scale around that is that when we are building these models, we try to uh, keep those things in mind as to what is it we need, what is it so that we're not building just a purely mobile specific model or a fashion specific model. So we look at a number of things and, that, and out of that work came things like, what are the common intents? What is common between these guys so that we don't have to build separate models for that. So all that analysis helps us determine, you know, how many models we really need to build, right? So that really helps from a scalability perspective. Uh, and lastly, the language thing is a big scalability thing as well. Um, and that is hard. Uh, and so for that, we're building really good translation to help deal with those things and keep all the, uh, the key functionality for the decision bot in English, right? So which means all the computing for the decision bots happening in English, but you have adapters for language and voice. And so that way we're able to deal with uh, we, we will be able to deal with a wide range of languages and voices and so on. But the core work is going to happen in English. And it's really important also because more, most of the people in my team don't speak the Indian languages. So it's easiest to keep everything in English uh, and then have the other things just be add-ons to it. Mm -hmm. do, do we have other questions? Uh, yes. So, uh, how does the data generation uh, process uh, work for you? So, you mentioned that you have uh, your model trained from scratch. So, like, uh, I just I was just curious to know how did you go about the data gathering, data collection? How much data would be enough, and what kind of data would be necessary for this kind of uh, like work? Yeah, good, good question, great question. So how do you get, how do you bootstrap this, right? So we uh, bootstrap this entire effort by using agents. So we had agents who, uh, so initially when we started this, there was no, no machine learning, there was no decision board. Every query would go to an agent, right? And we opened the traffic so that we could handle the queries that we're sending. So we got a whole bunch of queries from that and we started from that data set. So we started with a data set that was primarily agents, and then we started training on that. But now, since we have the bot, now we continuously get a lot more queries, uh, which are addressed more at the bot than the agent. So we started with the agent data set and then uh, trained from that. And then we did labeling around that, and we labeled things. We uh, had human labelers. We have hundreds of labelers who label all these things for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for our question, Mausad. Uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, what, what is the uh, accuracy of those, uh, of those bots? Um, so um, in terms of overall, um, say, for example, intent recognition and so on, um, we are, um, you know, we have a precision of over 90% uh, precision for intent recognition. And we have very high F1 scores as well, close to 90%. Um, and in terms of the answerability of the questions, right? For the areas that are in scope for our product, we are answering over eighty percent of all the questions. So we haven't we haven't opened up the scope for everything, but for the areas that are in scope for us, we are doing a pretty good job. We are doing a reasonable job, right? Mm -hmm. say, uh, the the area that we need to improve is we are obviously not answering all their questions. So when we launched the bot, we had narrowed down a bunch of areas that would we would ask questions, and in those areas we are doing well. But uh, we we need to expand that, and um, we'd like to be able to answer. You know, our goal is to answer eighty percent of all of your questions through the bot, and twenty percent to the agent. Right, that's where your goal is. Uh, we are not there yet for all questions. Um, uh, but uh, that's the that's what we are tracking towards. Mm -hmm. So I see a question from uh, Nishitha. 
how do you handle cases where the user's spoken language is uh, like not official language and you are not so support those languages in your system? Um, you know, the 11 languages covers most of the queries that comes, then uh, we just won't understand them. That's it. I mean, we'll probably transfer it to the agent uh, and give it to the agent. The problem is, you, you know, not all the agents speak all the languages anyway, right? Especially if it's outside these 11 languages, even the agents may not understand what the person's saying. And most people in India, a lot of people in India speak Hindi in some way, shape or form, right? Maybe it's not perfect, but they speak. So they're able to communicate. And that's been my experience as I've traveled throughout India is that most people are able to somehow communicate in a combination of Hindi or a combination of Hindi and English. Uh, so um, I know it, it some when you go to more remote areas, it gets more difficult, but the 11 languages that we have cover a vast spectrum of the people in India. And so I assume you had also like data set that contain, let's say a sentence. And in that sentence, there's a Hindi and English like combination of uh, both languages, right? Yes, that is very common. Mm -hmm. uh, people com combine Hindi and English all the time. People combine Hindi and Marathi all the time, right? So people combine these languages frequently and our systems are able to do a pretty decent job for about 11 languages or so. So I see a question from Max. Um, how do you measure precision, recall, and other metrics for intent recognition? Um, so, you know, the exact same way, I mean, it's no, it's no different from what anyone would do. Essentially, let's say you have an intent, right? Then there's a ground truth for the intent. So we uh, do labeling to determine what the ground truth for it is. So the model puts out uh, and says, this is what the intent looks like, right? And then the agent says, well, is, is, did we detect the intent correctly or is it some other intent? Then we built a confusion matrix for this and then we compute uh, the precision recall. Precision is uh, essentially the true positives divided by true positives plus false positives, right? So we compute that and we compute that for using a one versus many uh, you know, approach. And then we... Uh, we uh, wait, we, uh, we uh, aggregate the precision recall across all the different uh, intents uh, using a weighted approach. And that's what we report. So I see like a follow-up question from Max. Uh, do you have in-house uh, labelers? Yes, hundreds of them. Okay, and uh, how large are your ground truth data sets? It's also his question. Um, it depends on the, in the actual um, task, but typically, uh, we are talking about five to 10,000. Mm -hmm. I see a question from Eric. Um, have you been able to quantify business impact in terms of customer satisfaction uh, or cost savings for agents? Yes. So um, in terms of customer satisfaction, um, you know, uh, for this product, we have pretty high customer satisfaction, um, north of four out of five about 4.3, 0.4 out of 5 in terms of this product. Uh, based on, you know, whether obviously there's a little bit of a selection bias because uh, you don't, you're not required to give your feedback, right? So people are giving thumbs up, thumbs down data and so on. So it's pretty high satisfaction uh, for that. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, I can't go into the details of the cost or the um, revenue impact, but you know, uh, this is uh, very important for us. And, uh, um, you know, we, uh, uh, we, are, we are really not trying to focus on that uh, specifically, but we're really trying to focus on the customers happy with this or not. But uh, it, it is and it will lead to, uh, um, you know, revenue and cost impact for the company. You know, as a user, uh, like in general, different types of uh, products, it's always frustrating when, the bot doesn't understand what you mean and they don't redirect you immediately to a human because you want to speak to a human. <laughs> I, know. I, I, I know exactly what you mean. I, you know, my experience with bots as well, but you know, I have found some really good bots here, right? So for example, I think the Verizon bot is pretty good. I tried the Verizon bot out and I'm a Verizon customer and actually, you know, got me my answer pretty quickly. So initially I wanted to speak to an agent, but 
uh, I'm like, okay, I got my answer. I'm happy, right? I don't want to speak to an agent. And I think uh, that's why I think you need to get to about 80% of answers. If you can get 80% of answers, then people are going to be, uh, you know, okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, obviously, everybody wants to go to an agent, but we actually can do better than an agent, right? Because even the agents sometimes don't know the answers to the questions. And we can actually find the answers in a fraction of a second for you, right? And uh, so, but I know there's a psychological thing about, hey, you know, maybe the agent knows more than the bot. Um, yeah. And we will need to overcome that. But to deal with the massive traffic, there is no way that we can send people to age, everybody to agents. That's a problem, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I see a question from Mike. Uh, what do you do for dialogue state tracking? Like how do you determine what is the next step for the bot? So we have a, uh, um, we have a, um, an old internal tool uh, that uh, is a conversational tool, right? And right now that whole conversational tool, uh, that, that dialogue tool, right? Allows, allows you to specify what you, what, what you do based on every state. So it's a big finite state machine today in terms of how you track this dialogue flow. And um, there's a lot of the way that um, it's been designed today is uh, it's based on various kinds of rules uh, in order to take you from one state to the other state, right? So it's a fairly standard approach that we are using uh, for dialogue flow. And again, this is an area where we are investing to bring more ML approaches in order to figure out what is the next step in the conversation and so on, right? And so we are going to be working on things like multi-turn and using context and things like that in order to answer questions more accurately and also take the user to the next step in the turn. Mm -hmm. But if we have a tool, actually, you can do all this and specify this in this tool. Uh, I, I see a question from Eric. Uh, are you considering to open source uh, this technology? This tool we built from scratch. Uh, we even used it from open source. We built this tool from scratch. No, but are you are you planning to open source technology that you build in house? Oh, I see. I see. Um, the good question. Um, I don't have an answer to that uh, thing. Uh, I would say that at this point in time, the tool we have is really an internal tool. It's probably is not probably ready to be productized. When things is fairly fairly uh, new. So I don't know, never say never, but it depends on a lot of things, including company policy and all that, which I can't comment on right now. So I don't know. It, it, I think it'd be a good thing for people to use, um, but we'll have to see if there's interest from the community, then you know, certainly something I can take up the chain to make sure that we can potentially get some permission from the right folks in Flipkart. Yeah, yeah, I think it would like really benefit community, uh, especially you, c considering the, the the type of data set that you are using and um, the, the the rare, somewhat rare languages, right? Like a data set of rare languages that also you used to build your models. I think it, it would be really useful for for, for many for many people. Um, do do we have other questions? Uh, I don't see in the chat. Uh, um, probably my, my last question would be, uh, as I understood, you uh, deployed this solution for, for like two main verticals. So are you currently sort of like monitoring the performance in order to like deploy to other verticals? Is this uh, where you yes. are? Now? Yes, so where we are right now is that um, we, we want to, we are going into a lot of analysis on all the data that we are gathering uh, to identify where the gaps are where we're not answering questions properly, why we're not answering the questions, and so on. So we've actually built, uh, uh, we are in the process of building a very comprehensive analytics tool. We have some analytics, but we are building a very an comprehensive analytics tool so that we can um, really understand how to make the conversations better. So, so basically that they're monitoring model performance, right? So they're collecting those metrics from production? Yes. We are, we are, you're monitoring model performance, you're mod monitoring what is the customer saying, you're getting it labeled. Uh, so it's it's a lot more than model performance. It's it's also the how the conversation is going in the, uh, you know, how is the conversation 
the customer is it taking a, is it going well is it not going well are they getting angry are they happy and so on so we are monitoring a whole bunch of things around that to first really nail it for these two verticals and then understand the playbook to take it across 1500 verticals so do you have like human in the loop to define like okay customers happy angry and yes stuff? We have a human in the loop, and that's our operation staff, right? We have hundreds and hundreds of labelers who can help determine, look at the conversation, say, users happy. And then we also are building sentiment models that allow us to look at the conversation automatically and say that the customer is angry, not angry, right? Mm -hmm. Is happy, uh, is angry, neutral, uh, happy, right? Mm -hmm. So we can do that as well. Okay, so you're basically co combining that what model says and uh, human uh, labels. Yeah. Okay. And then slice and dice and look at it and say, uh, like, you know, the big part of the analytics is you then, you then, what you do is you say, okay, where is it that customers are angry and, uh, and, and the intent models are not performing well or whatever, right? So we can create all these slice dice scenarios and then look at the queries and say, ah, this is an area for opportunity. If I can fix this, I get 1%. So the whole thing in this, in this journey is that there are no silver bullets. It's not like you do one thing and everything works. Like there'll be a lot of half person, one person, half person, one person improvements here and there that will get things going. And after some time, there won't be half person. There'll be like you know, point 0.1 person improvement to make things better, right? But that is the uh, that is why it's a longer journey in terms of taking a data science approach to this thing. Uh, and that's why we need to have really good analytics so you can find the opportunities to improve. Yeah. So I see a question from Xavier. Can you discuss, uh, discuss the approach um, you use to label data? For example, metrics, uh, label agreement. I'm not sure what you mean label. Yeah, yeah so, so when, we, when we label data, right, there are two things we should look at. One is called disagreement, which mm -hmm. means what you do is, let's say you have um, a, a, a data set of thousand, right? Uh, then what you do is you send it to, uh, you, you send this uh, set for labeling, but out of that, you take like a hundred queries and then you have it labeled by two, by two labelers, the same query, right? And then you see how many queries that they disagreed on, right? So let's say out of the hundred queries, they disagreed on 50 queries, right? That means that's a 50% disagreement, which is bad. That means there's something wrong in this, right? Uh, you could, of course, send the entire set, but then that's more expensive. So you send some percentage of the set for labeling two people, and you compute what is the percentage of queries on which they disagree. And that number has to be below 10% for it to make sense, right? So that's one way. The second thing that we, we uh, that, um, you know, I've done in the past, but we are still in the work process of implementing is what we consider the gold set, which means we find queries that are labeled by an authoritative source. And we think we're very confident that these are the right labels for it. And then we intersperse them in the labeling. So for every labeler will get, in addition to the normal queries, they'll get gold set queries. And then we evaluate what is, how well is the labeler doing on the gold set, right? And so those are the two things that we use. Uh, and the other thing we have to worry about with labelers is that they don't, do, they don't collude. Because what some of these people will do is in order to get high, to get low disagreement score, they'll be colluding, asking each other, hey, you know, what did you do on this? And what did I do on this? Especially if they're sitting in the same room. And so we want to also make sure that the disagreement is not like zero, right? Which sometimes is when you get zero disagreement, it's pretty bad. So we use a number of these things in order to monitor our labeling uh, at scale. And this is super important to do. If you don't do this, you're going to get bad data. Uh, are you uh, also sort of build uh, uh, tooling for, for, for labeling or you're using some uh, third party solutions? Um, we are using both. We use, <laughs> in Flipkart, we use, um, uh, we have our own internal solutions. We have third party solutions and so on. So we use a bunch of uh, different techniques to do this. Um, ideally, we'd like to standardize on something, but we use combination of whatever works for the team. Yeah. 
Okay, I think uh, I think we can wrap up this presentation. I don't see other questions. Uh, it was really very insightful. Thanks, thanks a lot, Krish, for sharing. And um, the video recording will be ready like in a couple of weeks. I will post in our Slack. If you if you want to share this presentation with the community, and like some people already ask if this presentation will be available, please please do share. Um, and thanks thanks a lot. Thank you. It's, 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 it's a pleasure to join this uh, discussion group. Um, thank you and take care. Yeah, bye-bye. Thanks everyone for joining this talk. Bye-bye.